couple years I lived in Michigan, so I experienced this area. And now we're over here, kind of hard to see because I'm all the little lines, but you know, somewhere over here, if I got that right. So it's kind of interesting to think, you know, you could take a look at this map and see, okay, where have you been? Where have you visited? Where have you lived? You know, water will taste different in, in different locations sometimes. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, there's a couple other things that hardness affects if you're, um, if you're bathing or showering and you put soap on your skin, <coughs> excuse me, then um, very soft water has a difficult time getting the soap back off. So it'll feel like there's always that kind of a soapy layer left on there. Very hard water will cause the soap to not be able to lather very well. Um, it kind of, uh, chemically, it just causes it to curl over on itself in a way. So it, you have a harder time actually getting the soap to work uh, with very hard water. It just takes more soap. So it's kind of interesting the, the ways it might impact um, your daily life. But again, it's more of an aesthetic or a, a non-health concern. Okay, so, and we're not going to bother too much with uh, water softening. That is a certainly a a type of water treatment. It's not super relevant here and it requires a little more chemistry than probably a lot of you care for. Okay, so where do we start? Um, really when we take a look at a water treatment train or a water treatment system, the I call it a train because you, you know, kind of go one, one step to the next. Well, we take a look and we, we get our source water and this is kind of a typical setup for maybe a um, a surface water treatment plant where we're getting water from a lake or a river. The first thing we're going to want to do is have a screen and grit chamber. Now, we probably wouldn't need this for groundwater, but you know, if you're taking it from a a river, who knows if there's some branches in the water? Maybe some poor kid's basketball escaped and floated down the river. You don't want that in your treatment plant, so you just have to have first a very rudimentary screen. Um, also a grit chamber to try to get rid of any of the um, fine grit, um, like large sand particles, pebbles, things like that, that would probably uh, cause some problems with your, your pumping and, and things like that. Okay, so from there then you, the first thing, uh, the, I guess the next thing would be uh, primary sedimentation. Now sedimentation um, is really quite straightforward, we use gravity. Um, we can enhance that, so this would be our, our first sedimentation basin. In wastewater, we use these as well. We often call them clarifiers. That's okay to use either way. Um, it's effectively the same thing. It's just usually wastewater, they call them clarifiers, and drinking water, they call them um, sedimentation basins um, more frequently. Okay, so we have this one, and we just straight up use some gravity and see how much particles we can move. Uh, you know, remove as the water moves slowly through. Then we add some chemicals pretty often during this coagulation dosing. Then we let it sit with a very slow, gentle stirring, let the particles collide, get bigger, so that they're easier to separate. That's uh, what we'll work on um, the next couple lectures. Then we get to sedimentation. Um, again, so once we've made those particles bigger, we just send it through again, um, and it's easier to get rid of those particles. From there, we probably add some sort of filtration. This might, might be a um, granular filtration, so like a sand filter, or it could be uh, a membrane filter, but that's usually what we do next to get particles that are still in the water that we couldn't get just with the sedimentation. It's also kind of a backup in case some particles um, get by, kind of floating, floating by. At that point, we're usually clean enough um, that you know most of the particles are gone, and we can start um, start on our disinfection dosing. Give that some time in the system to have the let the chlorine take some time to act, and then finally, um, maybe we add some fluoride and send it through the distribution system. Okay, so that's kind of the the typical. You can add a few bells and whistles here, but this is um, this would be a, a depiction of your typical plant. Yeah, got a question? Yeah, so you said that the flocculation, is that when you do like six or is that mixing? 
Yeah, so the question is about flocculation, um, what's going on there. So that is, we've added the stuff that causes them to stick together. That's the, the period where we let, let that sticking process happen. So we gently stir it. We're going to cover that with, with a fair amount of detail. Um, so the, the flocculation is we're creating, we call them flocks. They're uh, particles made up of smaller particles. So these larger flocks, we just want to give the particles some time where they're, they are mixing, but just gently so we're not breaking the particles apart. All right. So sedimentation. Um, really, the point here is to use gravity. Um, a typical particle is probably going to have some random shape. In general, for this class, we're going to keep it to a sphere that it's nice and um, ideal. We're just making that assumption. Um, and it turns out in practice that it's an okay assumption um, unless you've got some, some strange system that's got uh, very funky particles. Um, it's usually all right to at least begin by modeling it with spherical particles. So when we think about, okay, we want to settle the particles. How do we know how much time we need to give them? You know, how fast will they be falling through the solution? Well, now we get to some physics. So we've got um, some particle, and really what we want to do is find a terminal velocity because that'll allow us to design our system <clears throat> so that we, we know that the particle will reach the, the bottom of the tank and stop and be kind of removed from the flow of water uh, once it reaches there. So to, to find that information, we need, to, we need to know something about how fast they're falling. So uh, to do that, then we, we take our particle and we say, okay, we've got a downward force of gravity. We'll call that Fg. We've got an upward force opposing that of the force of buoyancy, Fb. So the amount of water we're displacing, uh, the weight of that water is really essentially pushing back up on the particle, um, in a sense. And then if we have motion up or down, then we're going to have a f drag coefficient associated with it. Um, presuming that we're doing particle sedimentation instead of flotation, then our drag force will be in the upward direction. Um, I'll just make a note here that you can do particle flotation, and there are some systems designed that way. It's the same exact process, except you're probably adding bubbles instead of, um, it, you know, in your system and causing them to float, and you separate from the top instead of from the bottom, and otherwise it's a, a very similar process. In that case, the drag force would be um, downward instead of upward. Okay, so, you know, you've probably looked at physics problems like this. Okay, you've got an object falling through the air. Uh, what's its terminal velocity if all these parameters? Really, that's just what we're doing here. <coughs> and we're going to use water instead of air. So, uh, like I mentioned, Fg, the force of gravity, Fb, the buoyant force, and Fd, the force of drag. Um, we can write out all of these um, explicitly here. So the force of gravity is going to be the mass of the particle times the acceleration due to gravity. And I've got all these spelled out on the next slide so, um, uh, so that we can take a look at each of the, the units and all of that. Okay, so the mass times gravity, that's going to be our force, force of gravity, mass times the acceleration. Uh, we can express this instead of mass because it's going to be difficult to you know, find, find the mass of one little particle that's floating around in here. Um, that's going to be a difficult process, especially if it's you know, practically microscopic or nearly so. Um, so given that, what we would rather do is estimate the, the mass based on the particle volume. Because it turns out we have methods where we can measure particle size and particle volume relatively easily. Because if we, if we could make this assumption that it's a spherical particle, then we get a tool to give us which we can do uh, really easily. We've got one in my lab even that gives us the diameter of the particle. Then we can calculate the volume of the particle with that assumption. And then 
Um, we can get the density of the particle if we do some filtration and figure out, okay, how much, you know, how much do these particles weigh in bulk, get some sort of density value. So here we've got the volume times the density gives us mass because volume is, um, you know, obviously volume. Density is mass per volume, so those volumes cancel, leaving us with just the mass. So that's going to be basically the process for the force of gravity and the buoyant force because in the buoyant force case, we just need to know the density of water that it's displacing. Uh, it's the same process. Um, instead of the mass of the particle, we're doing the mass of the water. Finally, for the drag force, again, because we're assuming spherical, I should probably write that. Because of that assumption, oh, we can do a lot of these things, and we get the uh, the drag, um, the force of drag, equal to three times the viscosity of water times pi times the velocity with which the particle is settling times the diameter of the particle. So it's giving us, um, you know, kind of the a combination of the velocity with which it's going and the um, surface area that's in contact with the water um, causing that drag force. Um, combine that with the viscosity and you can get your force of drag. <coughs> okay, so what do all these numbers and symbols mean? I'm just gonna go through them. We've got the uh, force equations up here again. Mu is the dynamic viscosity of water. That's gonna be in kilograms per meter a second. And I believe those are the exact units that your your textbook might uh, that gives, except it might give it um, for the equation sheet. It might say times ten to the minus third um, in the unit. So watch for that. V s is our settling velocity. This is ultimately what we're going to solve for um, when we do the force balance. Um, that's just kind of the one unknown we're going to leave um, and solve for that so that we have something to work with to design our sedimentation basins. dp is the diameter of the particle. Uh, this is in meters. So these particles are going to be basically micrometers in diameter, but we've got to express it in meters if we're working in meters. We could use micrometers maybe, but then we have to convert our viscosity into micrometers. Uh, it's going to be more convenient just to convert everything to meters. I'll just tell you that now. Um, so keep in mind that these these particles, you're going to be given, um, you know, maybe 10 micrometer particles. That is, you know, so 10 micrometers. This is going to be 10 times 10 to the minus 6 or just 10 to the minus 5th meters. Okay, so just be, be ready and familiar with these conversions. Um, you will have to know that on the spot and it, it can get a tiny bit confusing if you do you know 10 times 10 to the minus 6 you know that's the same thing as 10 to the minus fifth so don't let the shorthand um, confuse you here just you know make sure you're comfortable with that conversion there So G is the acceleration due to gravity. Again, meters per second squared. Um, the M is the mass of either the particle, MP, or water, MW. That'll be in kilograms. The capital V is the volume of the particle, so VP. The rho here, rho P, is the density of the particle. And rho with no subscript is the density of the water. Um, that one is temperature dependent, so usually in these problems you'll be given a temperature uh, to work with, um, and then you'll have to use the lookup table. Uh, viscosity is also temperature dependent as well. So you use the lookup tables for the, the viscosity um, and the density, or they'll be just given to you. Okay, so then with all of that, we have all these pieces. Uh, once we know the temperature, we've got 
a fair amount of it, then we just have to be, you know, there's a lot of these that'll just, you'll be given um, some of the parameters, maybe you're solving for, for one or solving for how many particles are removed. Um, but with all of these, we can put these together, find our terminal velocity, and we can say, all right, that force balance, what it should end up looking like is really um, the force of gravity is going to be counteracted by the buoyant force and the force of drag. In the, in the case of skydiving, the buoyant force is pretty much nothing. So it just becomes force of gravity versus force of drag. Um, in our case, uh, it's a little bit opposite. Force of drag is not, you know, probably not as important, but it will, um, it will obviously bring, bring the particle to that um, terminal velocities preventing further acceleration. Okay, so if we take this uh, and we write out each of these terms, um, so force of gravity uh, equals the other stuff, we can write it out. So our force of gravity is really the volume of a particle times the density of that particle. So rho p, vp rho p times g. We can say that is equal to um, again, that buoyant force is basically the same. It's the volume of the particle times rho, which is the density of water, times g, plus that force of drag, which we said was 3 pi mu times lowercase v s times um, the diameter of the particle. Okay, and I want to just write out some of it so you could get a get used to the way I'm I'm writing it, so you can kind of see my handwriting as well here. Um, so that's volume of the particle, density of the particle, gravity, volume of the particle, density of water, gravity, three pi mu v s d p. And ultimately, we're solving for the velocity, the settling velocity of the particle, because that's that's kind of our uh, design parameter. So we're going to derive this equation. Um, and then we're basically going to use this equation. I'll give that equation to you on the formula sheet. But I wanted to make sure you guys knew where that was uh, coming from. So if we take this, um, effectively what we want to do is separate Vs. So I'm just going to take this term, put it on the other side, and start solving for, um, for Vs. So we'll say 3 pi... mu v s d p is going to be equal to v p rho times g minus v p rho particle times g <coughs> from here um, the volume of the particle we can actually express that in terms of uh, the diameter of a particle you know, the volume of a sphere, um, uh, what is it, pi over, pi over, uh, pi r cubed over six, or I'm, I might be getting that, um, something wrong there, but basically what we can do is convert this volume of the particle into diameter, then when we divide by this dp here, then we've got essentially, um, the g comes out of both sides, and some diameter term will come out as well. We're going to have rho minus rho p. Uh, we'll get that diameter of the particle. It'll be squared, because normally we have that volume and it'll be cubed, and then we're going to divide by this dp on the left. So we'll end up with that, and what I'm going to do is put the rest of the, um, the numbers on the on the bottom here, um, what is the formula of the, the sphere? Is it three fourths pi r four thirds. four thirds pi r cubed? Yeah. And so, if you were to take a look at how this math is going to work, um, and that that's for r, right? So, with diameter, we have to uh, cube that four thirds. So we cube that four thirds. Um, we end up dividing by this three. We divide both sides by pi, and that volume has a pi. Um, so that, we get rid of that, um, we div divide by the mu, and we already divided by that dp. It turns out that the, the end of the day we have 
18 mu. Um, you know, and it, sorry, I don't have don't have that all written out for you. I don't think you need it, but that's basically where it's coming from: is that volume converting into the diameter of the particle, and then all of these other pieces falling into place. So this becomes our equation. So um, make sure you don't forget that that diameter of the particle is squared. Sometimes in the heat of the moment on an exam, some students will forget that square there, and that obviously throws off your, uh, your answer. OK, and you'll have that on your, your formula sheet. And it's basically just coming from that force balance. Okay. So with that, uh, let's take a look at how we might design a sedimentation basin, given that we're able to calculate some settling velocity that should be a reasonable approximation of what's actually happening to particles, you know, given that we assume they're spherical, and generally we assume we have a bunch of the same type of particles, they're all the same density, stuff like that. All right, so in practice, sedimentation basins look like one of these two pictures here, we can have um, a circular one or a rectangular one. Um, we've got two aerial view shots here uh, just to kind of show you what's happening is either water is being uh, distributed from the center here going out the radius um, in any direction, or it's just flowing across um, in a straight line not that I can draw a straight line, but you know. Um, so in either case, essentially what's happening is you have um, a large, large area where you're flowing water across. You're sending it slow enough. You've got that laminar flow, so it's really not turbulent. And particles are able to just settle on their way. So really the particles are, are flowing sideways and slowly dropping. Um, so when we take a look at a cross section, then it's going to be we're going to kind of have a diagonal um, trajectory for the particles um, where the, the settling velocity is just the downward component. And just because it's flowing this across, we're getting the particles moving sideways. So if we were to look at, you know, take a cross section, even, even a cross section of the circular ones, if we were to do a cross section of this guy here, um, that path of the particle going from the, the center Sorry, the center out to the um, to the edge. Taking that cross section will have a rectangle. Okay, so when we take that cross section, uh, and in this case, you know we would be looking downward. So this is not the um, not the best example, but because it's uh, this is purely aerial. But if you imagine this was slightly tilted, we could have kind of that that rectangle there to look at. That'll make a little more sense in a moment. I'll, I'll draw it better. Um, but in either case, we can make this rectangle and see that the particle, if we've got a particle starting um, starting here, that's going to be the most difficult to remove because it's up the highest. Then its trajectory needs to come something like this and hit the bottom before it escapes in order for it to be settled. Um, you know, it's e going to be easier to remove a particle that starts here because it'll just hit the ground pretty early. Um, and if the water is moving too fast, that's going to be a problem. It's not going to get settled. So it has to be settled, hit the bottom before we reach the end of the basin. That's kind of how we uh, define it. OK, so uh, let's take a look. Again, this uh, rectangle that I'm drawing, this is a cross section. Um, we can imagine it as a, a tank that's going out like this or even one that's uh, curving around, you know, that that would be fine too. I'm going to erase these in a moment. But it, we could curve those all the way around, and this is just one cross-section of that circular sedimentation basin. Uh, for now, I'm just going to draw it like this, where we have, we're just kind of looking at the cross-section of, of a tank like this. And we can imagine its dimensions. and. In this case, we are not taking an aerial view, we're taking the side view. So something like that. All right. Okay. 
So hopefully this makes sense that we're not no longer looking at the aerial view. We're not going to look at sedimentation basins with an aerial view very often. Um, so usually when we start taking a look, we're doing this kind of side view um, where we can imagine the, the three dimensions kind of in space uh, behind it. Okay, so if we take um, a system like this, uh, there's a few key parameters here. We could say, all right, well, the the height here, h, that's important. That's going to be kind of the height of the sedimentation basin itself. Uh, we can say we've got a length here and a width here. So that gives us our, our uh, sedimentation basin dimensions. Then, as I mentioned a moment ago, if we have a particle starting here and it goes if, let's say it takes this trajectory. Um, in fact, I think, I think I can probably use a different color. If I get the right one. Yeah. Okay. So let's say if the particle, we'll draw a few different cases here. If the particle goes like this, then it is separated. And really, this is um, effectively falling faster than it needs to. So I'll say the settling velocity is fast. Then we can say we have a different color. Let's go with green. If the particle is traveling something like this, and we reach the end of the tank, and it didn't separate all the way, we can pretend that's basically a straight line. Um, in this case, Vs was kind of slow. Whereas kind of our design, by design, if we have something that goes straight from the corner to the other corner, and let's pretend I uh, met at the corner there. So this is our kind of treatment design to reach right at that point that's kind of our design velocity. We design the system so that for whatever particle that we're targeting, this is its velocity trajectory. So I'm going to say Vs, in this case, equals V0. So, um, and that's because we're going to define V0 as the critical settling velocity, and I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, so let me come back to our normal color. So if we, if we consider H being the height of the reactor, then HP is going to be the height of the particle. And the particle doesn't always start at the top. We just design it for the top one. right? So if we had a particle, um, I guess I'll draw this down below, actually. So if we have, you know, I'm, a, I'm just drawing it below so I'm not confusing with the image above. But if we had HP in some other system, um, that's the height of the particle from the bottom of the basin. So that's what I'm meaning for the HP here. This could be, you know, maybe the particle starts right here. Then that would be what I'm referring to. OK, so HP is the height of the particle. Um, for complete removal, Excuse me, um, that was uh, the wrong way to draw that. In terms of having complete removal, the distance with which the particle falls needs to be h, right? So let me let me redraw that. I'm sorry. So if hp is the distance the particle falls, then this would be an example of hp the distance between here and here. Actually, that would be the distance from here. So the particle fell this distance, and it needed to go a little further. Okay. I do apologize. This wasn't very clear. I'm just going to leave it like this, HP. There we go. So that's 
that's the particle's settling distance, okay? Um, and of course, HP in this case, in the blue case, would be H, it would be equal to H, and as well as in this case, we see here in this green case, a slower case, HP did not uh, end up equaling H, so it was not removed. All right, that's not super important. You already kind of understood what was happening there, uh, so I shouldn't have even um, spent too much time there. The, the distance that it's going to fall, however, is going to be equal to that settling velocity times theta. So the amount of time the water stays in this sedimentation basin, that's theta, right? That's the residence time. It, the water will reside in this chamber for that amount of time, and it's really just flowing in the one direction. So if we were to draw the flow direction, in this case, Q is just flowing that way, and Q is going to continue flowing out um, the other side. So for, for this um, settling distance, really that's, you know, mass per, uh, excuse me, the meters per second, that's a distance per time, multiplied by time, that's going to give us our distance. That's the vertical component, the downward component of travel for the particle. Um, so our HP, when we say that's equal to Vs times theta, what we're saying is distance per time multiplied by time gives us our distance, right? And remember now that the theta is V over Q. So Vs times uh, V over Q is, is what we have here. And when we design our, our basin to have exactly the right dimensions for this particle to be removed, we define this as the, that V naught for, for those exact, um, for that exact case. You got a question? No, sorry, this is, this is not a volume term, this is the velocity term. And I, I should have drawn this a little bit uh, smaller. So yeah, the, no, the oh, oh, yes, yes. This is the volume of the chamber, yeah. Okay. So this, this is the volume of the basin. Good call. So yeah, so the, the theta is always volume of whatever reactor, whatever chamber we're in, um, divided by the flow rate through that chamber. Good question. All right, so we're going to define this uh, V over Q equal to V naught when, when the HP equals H. Okay, so when, when we have that exact case where it hits right at the, right at the end of the chamber, um, that's what we've got. Okay, so we can take a look. Um, When we have, you know, if we were to take a look at this in terms of comparing V naught to Vs, we can have a few different cases where um, that settling velocity is, can be more than or less than our design velocity. So that, again, that V naught is what I'm calling design velocity. So again, we're just gonna imagine this as a kind of a chamber, some, uh, 3D characteristics. This will become important again in a minute. Um, do that way. Okay. All right. So we have. We have this case where if V naught is less than, excuse me, is greater than the settling velocity, so V naught being this line um, where we, we reach the corner, the line was going so well and then it didn't. So if this is our V naught, and really 
the V naught is actually just the downward component, but it makes the particle reach downward just in time. If we compare that downward velocity to um, to a settling velocity um, that is smaller, so a smaller settling velocity is going to have a smaller downward component. It's going to come here, right? So in this case. This is holding true with the current diagram, right? So in that case, not all the particles are settled. In fact, only a portion of the particles that are um, that started kind of below this point would have settled, because we could draw a line from here or about here uh, using that V S, and we would get that many particles settled. And we can actually look at that proportionally in its you know, a, an exact fraction there. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. OK, so there's the case where Vs is slower, is a smaller number than V0. Okay? Um, alternatively, and I'm going to, we'll, um, you know what I'll do is I'll, once I find my cursor again, we'll highlight that one with a different color. So we can kind of keep track of that case. So that was the case for V naught greater than V S. Okay, another case could be where we have V S that's quite fast. So the downward component is larger than the V naught. And in this case, we have V naught is less than or equal to Vs. So it's, you know, when V naught is equal to Vs, that's exactly the particle we designed for, right? That we decided that all particles of exactly this um, settling velocity will be settled. Um, that's what we're designing the reactor to. That's when V naught is equal to Vs. Anytime we have a faster par settling particle, and this is all very intuitive once I spell it out, I'm just trying to make sure that it's making sense to you uh, on the diagrams themselves. Okay, in that case, all particles will be removed by these uh, sedimentation basins. All right. So, uh, kind of another step forward we can we can do then is to take a look when we when we say our design velocity. You know, if we design for a specific particle and we say Vs is equal to V0, then we can say, well, our V0 then is equal to the height that the particle settled, so that Hp divided by theta. Uh, this is just taking that formula from earlier where we were taking a look at the height that the particle will settle, and we're just solving for the V0 instead. Um, so with this V naught, um, writing it this way, we can then say V naught is going to be equal to um, the height of the particle divided by V over Q. Now the volume, and, and excuse me, this is the height. If the height of the particle for the V naught case the height that the particle settled is going to be equal to the height of the basin itself. So this is actually just h. Um, for for v not for for this case h is equal to the that particle settling distance. Okay, so with this um, one part of the component here, this h, this this volume term, one part of the volume is actually the height. So that will cancel, and we're going to be left with. Uh, so we can rewrite this. Let's go ahead and rewrite this first. We can rewrite this as h divided by the volume, which is length times width times height divided by q. Okay. So in this case, the heights are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with the v naught equal to q over length times width which is equal to Q over the area of the basin. And that's the area down here. That's the surface area at the bottom of the basin. Area of basin. 
Okay, so this little process that we just did um, was quite interesting, and it'll make it'll make some sense well, when we talk it through. But effectively, the height of the, the sedimentation basin doesn't matter at all, um, in a sense. The, the volume matters, and therefore the height matters. But when we look at our design velocity, this equation, um, I'm just going to highlight it here, v naught equals q over ab. That equation, you're going to need to know for these problems. Um, and so the fact that the this design velocity has nothing to do with the height of the basin is a little bit counterintuitive if you're thinking about the particle settling some distance. But the reason is because, you know, if you were to if you were to have a very, very wide um, uh, tray and think about how quickly water is going to go across it, well, a small volume of water or small flow rate, it's going to go very slowly because it's spreading out over that entire wide area. So it's, it's actually that area that uh, combined with the flow that gives you all that information about how much time a particle will have to settle. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting and it's um, good to know that that height term really comes out of the whole um, the whole equation. Okay. Now keep in mind we've defined this reactor this uh, this specific trajectory and we've written this up for the specific case that we designed it for when V naught is equal to Vs but obviously Vs is going to be different from particle to particle. So v, Vs is not always, um, you know, it's, ac it's actually quite rare that it's equal to V0. So make sure to keep those two terms uh, separate in your mind, that the V0 is what we designed it for, and then Vs is the observations we make and compare to the design. So I might give you a, a problem that says, we designed a clarifier to remove exactly all of the particles, this size, this dimension, um, how is it going to do if you change the temp temperature? How many particles will it remove? So you have to calculate a new Vs for that um, and then compare it to this V0. Okay. Um, I think what I'll do is I think I'll leave it off here um, and that way we can touch on some of the calculations, a you know, couple more equations just in terms of how many particles will be removed. Um, take a look at that and a couple interesting features of sedimentation basins. Do a practice problem and then start on the coagulation flocculation. Okay, uh, any questions before you go? Um, one last announcement here. I will likely be posting the first quiz sort of thing um, probably before the weekend. Uh, I'll give some details on Moodle and send out an email. Um, this one, partly it'll just be feedback on how you like the lecturing format so far, see how I can improve, um, and it might give you a couple things about chemistry, stuff like that. Uh, but this will just kind of be the first one, uh, kind of low-key. So look, look for that. I'll send out an email. All right, if nothing else, have a good weekend.